Welcome. In Swahili, we say Karibu. So for any questions that may be had, we can post them in the chat box, um, even as we begin our series. So by way of background, this is the first installment of our publishing in surgery series by the Annals of African Surgery, the quarterly publication of the Surgical Society of Kenya. We provide a medium where surgeons can exchange current information from across the African region. You can find us on our website, www.africansurgery.com, or you can follow us on Twitter, at African Surgery. I'm your host, Dr. Benjamin Jehia, a general surgeon and an assistant editor at the Annals of African Surgery. We have prepared three vignettes for you today that we hope shall be relevant to you, our audience, whether you're an undergraduate who is interested in, in research or you're a head of a unit um, looking to expand your team's footprint in the knowledge sphere. We shall talk about choosing a study question, the structure of a manuscript, and the approach to referencing. Following the presentations, we shall have a discussion where any questions that have been forwarded to the email address, which I shall now say, w, no, that is admin at annalsofafricansurgery.com. I'll say that again, admin at African, annalsofafricansurgery.com. Questions can be sent there or posted on the Q&A section of our chat box and they shall be addressed. Without further ado, let's start off with choosing a study question. And as Dr. James Kigera shares his presentation, allow me to introduce him. He currently serves as the Editor-in-Chief for the Annals of African Surgery. He's a practicing orthopedic and trauma surgeon with clinical interest in shoulder arthroscopy. Additionally, he's also a lecturer at the Department of Human Anatomy at the University of Nairobi. He's the immediate former president of the Kenya Orthopedics Association, and among his long list of accolades was fretted at the International Emerging Scholar for 2019 by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. We welcome Dr. Kigera as you share your insights on how to choose a study question. Karibu, Dr. Kigera. Thank you, Dr. Njihia, for the glowing introduction. I hope you can all hear me. And, yes, uh, we can hear you, Doc. Please proceed. Thanks, Benjamin. And uh, welcome to all the participants from all over Africa. And I hope you will find this uh, series of uh, uh, lectures that we plan to do in the course of the year useful to you as you start to uh, do your, your, your research. So, Choosing a study question, and the outline for my talk is we're going to look at why would you want to do this? And then if you do it, are you going to do something that journals will be interested in publishing? Then we will look at how you, how you should go about doing this, how the study question should look like, and then the steps to follow as you go along. As was mentioned, I am the Editor-in-Chief of the Annals of African Surgery and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so you might see those biases in the course of my uh, lecture. Why would anybody undertake to do a research uh, paper? Why would anybody undertake to do research? Why would you think about authoring a paper? Sometimes it's a little bit of you have to do this for yourself. You are an MED student and it is required that you write something before they give you your papers. Maybe you have done a course and they say before you graduate, you must have submitted something. Maybe you're thinking about getting a job or you need to be promoted or you need to get tenure at your university. Or maybe you have thought that maybe applying for a grant is uh, a good way to expand your career. Or you want to be recognized uh, in your field so that people would know that you are uh, doing the kind of work that you're doing. And maybe it is to network with others. But sometimes surgeons would do this for humanity. You want to do this for other things other than yourself. 
And maybe there is a global question going on, COVID-19, should we operate, should we not operate? How long should we wait? Should we measure the antibody levels? Or maybe it's a local question, malaria and COVID-19 and surgery. What happens if the person doesn't have a spleen? So maybe there is a question that you need to answer and this question might be local to you or it might be a global question. Sometimes you want to inform the world. Um, all the major diseases that we know about started with case reports. So somebody discovers people who are getting malnourished and they have a certain retrovirus in their system. He writes a case report and informs the world about what's happening. A couple of guys in Wuhan, China, develop pneumonia. Somebody publishes about that and the world gets informed. Maybe you want to validate a new technique or there is a new aspect to how we should look at a certain illness or a certain treatment. Uh, and maybe sometimes you just want to document your experience and compare notes with others. Sometimes we do research to stimulate interest. You might want to do a systematic review to look at what people have done in a certain area, and then that might stimulate some interest. Once you have come to terms with the fact that you want to do this and you have a reason to do it, and then you want to ask yourself, if I do this, will journals publish it? And what are editors looking for? They're looking for new things and new treatments and new population in which this uh, disease has been manifested new knowledge, maybe a new disease distribution. They're looking for something that is interesting, and hence if it's interesting, then it will be citable by others. Above all, we're looking at some for things that will change practice. Should we give antibiotics 30 minutes before surgery or 60 minutes? Does that reduce the surgical site infection rate by 30% or by 0.03%? So it is practice changing that editors are interested in this. We are also looking for collaborative research and things that are global. Increasingly, we want to see uh, north and south collaboration or even south south collaboration. Once you have a question or an idea you have and you think it's interesting enough or novel enough, how do you go about looking and designing this question? Some of the things you want to consider are the resources that you have, the human resources that you have. Do you have enough people to go out and collect the kind of data that you want? Do you have the facilities to give you the kind of data that you want? So if you want the antibody status of everyone who walks in through the emergency room, uh, to a certain illness, say COVID-19, do you have the capacity to measure these antibodies? Do you have the finances to pay the human resource, to pay for the resources, the ingredients that you're gonna use? Do you have the expertise? This expertise could be both human resource in terms of managing your team, could also be clinical. You want to write about uh, anterior uh, approach for total hip replacement, but do you have the expertise to perform an anterior approach for total hip replacement? Do you have the statistical uh, capacity to do uh, the analysis that you want to do? But above all, what is your passion? What is it you're passionate about? What would you do at the drop of a hat? So where do you start? It might help to start with things that are common in where you are. If fractures of the tibia are common, that might be where you want to start. If it's hernias, that's a good place to start. Then ask yourself, what is unique about the conditions that we're seeing? Are they presenting as we expect them to present? Are we managing them the way we should or the way others are managing them? Are our outcomes any different or are we getting different outcomes from the guys in Tumbuktu or Mongolia. Sometimes it helps to look at what is topical, what is topical in your specialty. Um, if you are in your hepatobiliary surgeon, and maybe the in thing right now is a certain method of liver transplant, 
that maybe aligning yourself with what is topical in your specialty is not a bad idea. Aligning yourself with what is topical globally, uh, like we are now in this pandemic, that might not be uh, a bad idea as well. Sometimes it helps to, al to align yourself with either funders or with policy. Uh, in Africa for a long time, a lot of emphasis was on infectious diseases, so HIV, malaria, uh, childhood uh, infections were getting lots of funding. But the, the shift is moving now towards, towards injuries, towards non-communicable diseases, and now with COVID, um, there are other things that you could align yourself to them. When you're designing this research question, what should it look like? It helps if the question is clear. And by clear, we mean that it is easily understood without someone needing to look for a dictionary. It should be clear to the audience that it is targeted to. It should also be focused such that it narrows down on a specific issue. And I'll try and show you an example as we go along. It should be concise, meaning that it needs not many words for you to describe it, so that it is not a paragraph. It is a sentence or a couple of words. It should be objective, and as far as possible, it should be measurable. So you should not ask, are surgeons happy with a particular implant? Maybe you should ask, uh, what percentage of surgeons uh, rate that implant highly? Whatever it is that you want to study should at least not be accepted fact. It should be something that is arguable. It should be a place where there is a gap. And the question that you ask should not be obvious. It should be something that people would pose and ask themselves, ah, Maybe, maybe this guy has a point. We had never looked uh, at it uh, this way. It should also be relevant to the situation, to the times, and to your specialty. It should be original, not necessarily that you are designing a new procedure, but it should be novel in some way. There should be a new aspect to it. It should be interesting, appealing to your uh, target audience, and it should be researchable with the means available to you. So it does not help to come up with a question that would be difficult in your circumstances to research. It should be ethical, whether this is human ethics or animal ethics. No matter how convinced you are that you want to randomize some people to get COVID-19 and others not to, and then you see how that progresses, if it's not ethical, then you shouldn't be thinking about it. Analytical questions are usually better than descriptive because more likely than not, unless it's a new illness or a new procedure, the descriptive bit has already been done and what we're looking for is a different take into it, an analysis into it. So what are kind of the steps that you would follow? So the first thing you wanna do is choose a general topic, and this usually would align with what your passion is. So you choose surgical site infection, or you choose uh, umbilical hernia repair, or you choose a uh, hemicolectomy, and then you do a little bit of research on that topic. This is usually better than an armchair speculation. The research will let you know what other people have done, it will also give you an idea of what the gaps might be in that area, what has not been studied. Consider your target audience, and then as you do that, list some preliminary questions, and then evaluate these questions. So this might be a way in which you look at uh, your question and you ask yourself, maybe, this is the way I want to go. So your broad area might be post-operative infections. And then you think, as you narrow down, that you're thinking about risk factors and you have this belief that maybe malnutrition is a risk factor uh, for post-operative infection. And then as you narrow further, you ask yourself, maybe some micronutrients, 
maybe vitamin D might be uh, useful in preventing postoperative uh, orthopedic infections. And then you can start thinking of designing a study where either you measure the vitamin D levels of people and see uh, those who develop infection and those who do not, or better still, if you supplement, does that reduce your uh, incidence of postoperative surgical site infection? It helps to ask yourself how your question would be answered, because then that will guide the next uh, step. Find a niche, find a gap. What is it exactly in that area that you're looking for that hasn't been answered? Then once you find that niche, then ask yourself, so what? If we answer this question, then so what? What changes? What is it that will change if we answer this question? Then hypothesize the pros and cons against your question. Ask yourself, what would people say is a strong point about this question? What would they say doesn't work about this question? Consider your PICO and your PO for those who may not know what that is. PICO stands for the population, uh, the intervention, control, and outcome. So as you design your question, you're asking yourself, this study will be done in which population? Will there be an intervention or an, uh, 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 an item of interest that we're looking for? Will there be a control group of people who do not get the intervention? And what outcome are we, are we thinking about? And PO is basically uh, usually for observation studies uh, or qualitative studies where you're asking yourself, what is the population? What is the exposure? And what uh, is the outcome? Once you've done that, I guess you can begin your question. So for example, a question like, how can surgeons reduce postoperative infection? If you look at a question like that, it's a little bit vague. It's not precise. And hence, as you begin to dissect further, maybe some of the things you're thinking about is, are you talking about risk factor? And are you thinking about doing something to those risk factors, for example, in an intervention? And then are you thinking about the outcome of postoperative surgical site infection? And is your population the people who are undergoing a primary total knee replacement? So narrowing it down would help. If you ask a question, for example, are Kenyan surgeons using antibiotics before surgery? The challenge with this question is that it requires a yes or no answer. And hence, it may not be an appropriate uh, question to design a study around. Maybe what you want to find out is the timing of preoperative antibiotic use, and then maybe you want to look at an outcome, for example, uh, of surgical site infection. In summary, we need to consider the components of a good research question. I think we've looked at the steps to developing a good question and some of the pitfalls uh, that we can avoid. I think Dr. Njihia will allow me to take questions at the end. I think that is how he has designed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kigera, for getting us off to a wonderful start. Um, even as you've tackled that aspect of choosing a study question, with practical examples on the same. Just to encourage us that um, for those who have not yet found us online, we are found on www.annalsofafricasurgery.com. You can also follow us on Twitter on at African Surgery. What we shall also do is for those who might require continuous professional development points, we'll ask that in addition to your registration, we shall also counter check with the email address that you'll be able now to share on the chat box so that we know who needs um, CPD points and then we can process that as well. Our next presenter is Dr. Stanley Aruyaru. Dr. Aruyaru is an associate editor at the Annals of African Surgery. 
He's based at the St. Teresa Mission Hospital in Kenya, where he serves as its Director of Medical Services and the Quality Lead. This is in addition to practicing as a general surgeon. His recently published book, Chronicles of a Village Surgeon, is available on paperback from both Amazon and rafubooks.com. Dr. Aruyaru will be speaking to us on the structure of a manuscript. Welcome, Dr. Aruyaru. Thank you, Benjamin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're calling from. Benjamin, please confirm that you can see the screen I'm sharing and that it can move. I confirm that we can see the screen and we can hear you. Please proceed. Thank you very much. James has elaborated on how we can formulate a question and come up with a study question for research. I am here to elaborate on how do we go about writing what we've gathered, the general structure of a biomedical paper. Let's get on. What is worth the publishing perhaps is something that everyone, especially the emerging researchers will ask. And this is a pyramid of evidence. Anything on that pyramid is worth publishing. At the pinnacle are the systematic reviews and meta-analysis which we publish on our journal, followed closely by controlled trials, randomized controlled trials, be they double blind or single blind or triple blind. Then we've got cohort studies, case control studies, case reports, name it. But you also realize that our journal has a place for basic sciences. That is where you see animal research there. That is where you see in vitro research. So essentially, anything that appears on that pyramid of evidence is applicable and is admissible for publishing. If you look at the general consensus on the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors on what should be the segments on any manuscript, you see that there's a title page, there's an abstract, there's an introduction, there are methods, right all the way to supplementary information like use of units of measurement, abbreviations, illustrations, etc. But when you come home, like we'll be talking briefly every journal has got a specific way that they want their papers structured. The papers that we accept are these categories shared with 4,001 limit, case reports with 2,500 word limits, and review papers with 6,000 6, words. Each of these require an abstract on top of the main paper. Then we have editorials, short communication letters to the editor, and many more will keep coming as the journal grows. Suffice to say, when you think that you have your manuscript ready, please ask your relevant editor. It might not be the Annals of African Surgery, but every journal will have a segment titled Guide for Others. That is where they will tell you how, how they want their paper structured. For our journal, if you go to the annals of africansurgery.com forward slash guide for others, you will find that information. But let me pick your interest in what is the proverbial pushing of a camel through the eye of a needle for the residents in the room, for the young consultants in the room who have got this humongous collection that must be condensed to a five page manuscript for publication. Turning a thesis into a journal article is akin to turning a mountain into a molehill. Now, when we look at research, this is from ophthalmology, are published in 30% of the time over up to six years general surgery, similar rate, similar waiting time. Doctoral fellowship, smaller rate, just a quarter, a century or 25% will publish their doctoral thesis. Could the question be how to convert what you've gathered over years into something that is convincible and accept, acceptable to the others? I think the answer should be yes. But that's, that's the formula we are looking for today. And I want to engage you a little and request you to, chat, to type on the chat and uh, just 
type anything that comes to your mind. What are the sections of a thesis? What are the sections of a thesis? So I will ask Mohammed, who is the chat monitor for the evening, to read for me what people are typing. Please type. You don't have to type everything. Type whatever comes to your mind. What is to be found in that thesis? What are there? Of course, there are differences, I know. Of course, there are figures, so those are giveaways. Mohammed, any answers so far? Um, yes, the first answer we have is from Dr. Benjamin G here. He says uh, the declaration. Declaration of Hunashit. Thank you, Benjamin. You can just read the titles without reading the people so that people okay. are free to okay. make errors. Yes. All right. Someone else says acknowledgement, ethical considerations, introduction, methodology. A couple of people say methodology as well. Great. Thank you, Mohammed. All those are brilliant suggestions. Mm -hmm. All those and many more as you will find. Now, the issue here is that that thesis is likely has got an introduction, a literature review, the theoretical framework, discussion, methods, results, conclusion, a hundred references or more, countless figures, it's over a hundred pages, yet we are here today. Shamelessly telling you that we need an introduction that is two to three paragraphs, methods that are seven paragraphs, results that are seven paragraphs, these are averages, a discussion that is six paragraphs and don't give us anything more than 25 references and a few figures. How do you go about that? How do you convert 125 pages to five pages? We'll talk about it in the next couple of slides. The IMRAD format stands for introduction, methods, results, and discussion. This is an adopted structure for most of the biomedical articles, especially original articles. And what are we calling for in every of those four segments? Introduction is what opens the paper. It answers the question, what? And despite your 20 pages of introduction and another 10 pages of literature review in your thesis, we need you to take one paragraph that summarizes that by giving us accepted definitions, known facts and agreed concepts. The next paragraph should chronologically follow and give us what is unclear, what is unknown, and where the knowledge gap exists. And finally, to conclude your introduction, tell us what is the problem statement. Is it a higher rate of infection after total knee replacement, like James was mentioning? What is your hypothesis? Do you want to reduce it? And how will the research you're undertaking handle that? Then we go to the next segment, the methods. This is usually in the past tense when you write. But for your thesis, it is usually in the future tense because you're giving a proposal. When you're writing for the manuscript, it's in the past tense because you are retracing the steps of what was done, answering the question, how was this answered? Different study designs will lend themselves to a tweaking here and there. But the bottom line is, if anyone else from whichever corner of the public would pick that, they should be able to reproduce the results that you have reproduced. And speaking of results, then just answer that question, what was found? And what's important is, what did you set out to find? And what did you find? If you sought out to find in a certain way of objective one, objective two, and objective three, our expectation when we read your manuscript is that the results are also arranged to answer those specific objectives which is also the same way the methodology was tracked down to answer those objectives. Do not describe, unless it is a qualitative study, use figures and charts, use tables and charts. And then we have the discussion. This is a big question that my EIC likes to ask. Okay, how come, or so what? Very difficult questions to answer. You are, you are discussing what you, pro hypothesized what you found out, but you're answering how come that your results are like this? Why are they like this? And so what do you mean? Yes, you found this percent. So how does it compare to the rest of the world? 
in a different population? And what should we do about it? Again, it's often in sequence with the results and you are telling us why your results are the way they are and what they imply locally and internationally. I want to share this funnel in, funnel out schema that looks at how then you arrange your abstract because once this is in mind, it is a little easier to capture it. So we start with say title abstract, leave that there. You look at the introduction and realize the first statement of the introduction as I was as broad as possible. Definition, the heart is round, calm down. The heart is warm, calm down. There's global warming, et cetera, et cetera. Whichever way you want to look at it. If it's geographical, start at the world, come to Sub-Saharan Africa, come to Africa, focus to Meru County, for instance. And then the segment of the methodology and results will only be addressing that aspect that you're looking at. So on the Y axis, you are going down in logical order, but on the X axis, as you can see, you are going broader and narrower on the thematic scope. So that in the methods and the, and the results, you are tailored to your specific objectives, not moving out. When you get to discuss, Again, you start discussing those results in that score, and then you expand them to the next sphere, and then you expand them and see how generalizable they can be. So that by the time you're concluding, again, you are the wi at the widest in terms of the matrix scope. I hope that is easier, but let me give an example. If you, if you want to talk about Meru, you would start like this at introduction, the world, middle income countries or low and middle income countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya, Meru County. If you have to look at say motorcycle accidents, you would start your discussion on the comments about non-communicable diseases are common, surgical disease burden is still there, injury is a significant portion of surgical pathology, road traffic accidents are the contributors, the main contributor to the injury profile, and then you narrow down to motorcycle accidents. Now, when it comes to discussion, you flip what you said in discussion. You start discuss what you said in introduction. You start discussing at the specificities of the motorcycle accident, seeing how that correlates with road traffic accidents, how that fits into the injury profile, how that fits in the surgical pathology or disease burden, and how that looks at the non communicable diseases, but in the entire low and middle income world or in the entire world at large. To conclude, the IMRAD is a 3776 formula. Three paragraphs for introduction, seven paragraphs on methodology or less, seven on results and six on discussion. Although this is a general arrangement, it is always advisable that you seek the guidance from the editors of the journal. The aim is to have a logical flow that is from introduction all the way to discussion. And it is important again to adhere to those specific guidelines from those others. Don't give them something proximate, adhere to the instructions for others. Thank you very much. And back to you, Benjamin. I will be taking questions at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Ariaru. I think we will settle for the middle-aged Bulgaria rather than the young Turk. Um, after Dr. Ruyaru has helped us squeeze the camel through the eye of the needle, last but not least on our panel of eminent speakers is Dr. Bahati Ryogi. In addition to being an associate editor at the Annals of African Surgery, she is also a practicing consultant general an oncoplastic breast surgeon at the Kisi Teaching and Referral Hospital in Kenya. She is the chair of the Oncology Committee of the Surgical Society of Kenya. And this evening will be taking us through an approach to referencing. Welcome, Dr. Ryo. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nji here for the humble introduction. Um, Happy to be here and thanks for having me. As um, he said in to the introduction, so we're here to do a presentation on referencing. This uh, comes well in following my uh, two colleagues who've 
presented on how you come up with a research question or idea and what is the structure of that. Okay, so in terms of outline of my presentation, I'll be talking about uh, introducing exactly what is referencing because we've had uh, a bit of that word being used by my two uh, colleagues previous to me. Why is it important for the author, editor and reader to have referencing? What styles of referencing are there and what are the expectations of the Annals of African Surgery? So referencing can be defined as an appropriate acknowledgement of ideas and work that has been originated from someone else. So we know very well from uh, what the predecessors have just uh, talked about, you come up with an idea and you have to do a thorough research. So while doing that thorough research, you're reading through literature, you're re reading through textbook, you're reading through um, any form of, could it be magazines, just to find out what is the information around this topic that I want to, to write uh, about. And therefore, it is this um, referencing that is required for you to acknowledge where you have gotten these ideas and thoughts that you, you do have. So it's a way of also providing um, supports, uh, providing support for claims and statements that you've made in, in a text. More so, it also shows the understanding of work and context that is in your test. And is it relevant to the topic or um, disease that you're, you're talking about? This can also be referred to as citing or referencing or, or a site. So sometimes they are used interchangeably. We cannot talk about um, referencing and not have plagiarism in the same um, uh, mouthful. Why? This is because if you don't acknowledge somebody's work, and you claim for it to be your own, then you're doing plagiarism, which is the act of taking the writings or work of another person and passing them off as one's own. And we know very well, this is considered as an act of forgery. As you remember, Dr. Kigera did say, this is the reason why people go into research to try and either get a promotion, to try and even get a degree while in school. And therefore, if you cannot acknowledge somebody's, ref uh, somebody's work, then this can easily be taken away from you. Why is it then important to reference work really? It's one that you get to acknowledge the work of another author, again, to avoid plagiarism as I've already alluded to. You also need to support the evidence or the claims that you make in your work. Are you saying that breast cancer is the fourth malignancy in countries X? Where was that evidence gotten from? How do you support that when you say that disease X is more common in younger women? How do you support that? It also enables us as a reader to find the sources of the quoted text. As we've already said, when doing our background check, we will go back to read other people's work. So you're citing somebody else's work. Therefore, if you also cite your work well, somebody else will also be able to cite you in return. It also tells the quality of work. So work that is not well referenced also gives you uh, um, an idea of what went into this work. Is it really authentic? So what should be referenced then in literature? All materials that has been quoted, either you've paraphrased it or you've summarized an idea should be referenced. Therefore, any idea that you've originated from somebody else data or information that is not common knowledge should be referenced. Now, here comes the challenge then. What do we describe as common, as common knowledge? When we say the world is round, you might think that is common knowledge, but somebody else might challenge that. Uh, where, where is the evidence that says um, uh, the world is round? However, with the structure of the write-up or manuscript has, has been presented by Dr. Riaro, the abstract usually does not have references because as he has rightfully said, the abstract is usually the summary of your work that will give um, the, the parts of it as he has explained also. Um, when you also think about it, your results will not have references because this is now your own work. However, when, I have, when I'm doing my work and I have to cite your results, then I'll have to quote you um, or cite you uh, because that is your work. However, when you're doing the manuscript in your in the results section, we do not expect to see references because that is your original work. So what are the sources of referencing? So this can be gotten from journal articles, scientific articles. And again, um, Dr. Riaro has gone through the levels of evidence uh, from systematic reviews to RCTs down to opinions and case reports. So again, when you're doing your referencing, this is one thing to 
to reflect and ask yourself, what is the level of evidence when I'm putting this in my, in my work? If you have a higher level of evidence, you're much better um, applying that uh, in your manuscript. However, that higher level of evidence or whatever level of evidence needs to be relevant to the topic that you're discussing. Um, you can also use current global databases. This has been known, I'll put their global can because it's one of those that gives us um, what is going on in the world about cancer literature or cancer um, population distribution. This is something that can be used. We also do go to textbooks to also give us uh, one of, you know, most of the theories that are well grounded on things will be found on textbooks, which you can cite. Newsletters have also been used. Case in point, for example, if you wanted uh, answering, following on to what Dr. Kira was talking about, if you wanted to find out whether surgeons prefer one implant or another, uh, somewhere in your discussion or in your research, you really want to know how many orthopedic surgeons are there. So you can find this well in the, in the Kenya uh, Medical uh, Practitioner and Dentist uh, Council website, you'll find it there. However, you can come down just as again, um, Dr. Riero put it, where you start very large in the world and you want to come down as down to your county and wonder uh, what happens when it comes to orthopedic um, procedures. And the hospital that the county could be having a healthcare newsletter that will then be able to give you insight to the local literature that is there. So we can use some of this as part of our referencing. What are the reference styles? And before we go into that, I thought it was important for us to kind of go, what are the parts of a reference? So remember, when you're reading literature in within the text, you will see either numbers or Roman numbers or um, names of people put with years. This can either be put in brackets or, or, or superscript. Then while going down, just as um, Dr. Ariaro again has given us the structure of a manuscript, way, way down, then you'll see the reference list of bibliography that will now have a full list um, that is giving us details of the summaries that we're seeing in, within the text. So we have um, common um, referencing styles that we use. So we have the Modern Language Association, which is the MLA. We have the American Association. The APA. And what you realize really, these reference styles are quite similar. So I've put Vancouver there. It might not be among the top three, but it's what, what we use actually in SS, in Annals of African Surgery. And in most of the medical literature, we, we do use Vancouver. So I've put it there just as a way of comparing to the two common ones. And we can see some things um, that are in um, common in all the styles. Uh, we are seeing Santini, which is the name of the author, appearing in both. So the order is what really changes. So you have the name of the, uh, the, the author of the article that you, uh, you're citing, the title of the article, where was this information published? Could it be a textbook? Could it be a journal? What journal is that? And then more details to kind of give you exactly. So it could be the Journal of Critical Care, but which year was it published? What page is it? So, so that you're able to go down and actually trace this uh, article in detail. Okay, so as I've said, the order is what will change. So you see the year will appear last in some, others it appears in one. And so it's all about the different styles. In-text citation. So I've picked this up um, from one of the random articles we have at the Annals of African Surgery. So here we talk about the sigmoid vovulus being a life-threatening condition affecting more males than females in ratios ranging from 2.1 to 10%. These definitely cannot be the words or thoughts or ideas of the person who's writing this article for the very first time. This means this is something that has been evaluated and for someone to say sigmoid volvulus is a life-threatening condition affecting more males and females, it shows that there must be a larger study that has been done to actually come up with this conclusion. And we see something in bracket one to three, so that tells us that is the in-text citation. And when we we'll scroll down to the end of the article, we will be able to see what does one to three uh, stand for. So they will stay like two, three days. Example two also talks about um, plagiarism is derived from a Latin word. And what I wanted to put there is actually the different styles of citations that we can see the in-text citations. So here we do see it being put in brackets. 
while here we see it being put as a, as a superscript. So it's just to show you they can take uh, different styles. However, what you realize in an article, even when you're doing your own as a referencing, you need to have consistency in whatever style you've chosen. So for academic um, uh, articles, different institutions will have different um, referencing styles that are allowed. So you'll have different universities might say they prefer two or three, while coming down to journals, uh, they will choose on one just to have consistency within um, the journal edition that they are doing. Then a reference list will look something like this. It might have numbers, one, two, three, as you see. So this goes back now to the Sigmund Corvillas paper. So this is what was meant in one, two, three. Sometimes, depending on the style, it might not have numbering where you have to put it in alphabetical order. So it really depends on what style has been chosen. What are the uh, Annals of African Surgery uh, prefer? So I picked this again from the instructions to authors. So only references clearly related to the author's work, that is very important, has been highlighted by my presenters before, should be referred to. And when this re references is made to, to work by more than three authors, you list the first three. Again, this is important. This will vary from one one journal to another. Some will tell you put the first three, some will say put the first four and put everyone else at, at all. Citations of references should be according to the Vancouver style so that going back to what we've just seen, I've also put an example down here of what a Vancouver style will look like. References in the body of the text should be in chronological order. What does that mean? So you can't have the first sentence in your introduction where you've said um, uh, women are taller than men in society X, and then you put your reference number six. So if it's your first um, idea or something that you borrowed should follow in that order one, two, three. However, you may repeat one. So you may end up with one, two, three, and at some point you come back to one, but it should be that order. And it should be identified in brackets um, rather than uh, superscripts, as we've seen. So what are the referencing tools? So there are quite a number of softwares out there that you can be able to do this with, because you can imagine this is actually very unimaginable, having to go reading all articles and writing down their commas, their um, brackets, the, the year that comes before that semicolon it can be daunting for somebody who's not done it before. Thankfully, we have softwares out there. Some are free, Mendeley is free. Uh, you can just install it in your computer and once you've read this article and it's 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 of interest to your research uh, project that you're doing at that time you save it somewhere in your database and when you're when you're doing your write-up all you need to do is either go to a words uh, document and put it inside unfortunately i think uh, this is beyond the scope of this talk but just to highlight that there are softwares out there that can make this much easier for you so in summary Referencing in an article informs the quality of the content within there. Okay, so if a article is well referenced and it's up to date, then it brings interest to the reader, to the author, and the people around. We need to adhere to the required style and then remain consistent. So uh, whatever style you choose, go by it. However, pay attention to detail, especially when you're uh, given the scenario that um, Dr. Ariaro did give, sometimes you have a thesis which you want to break down to an article, um, read the instruction to authors and be careful to see what style do they want. Um, sometimes you might take it, you might make more than one article, you just want to pay attention to that particular journal at that particular time, um, numbering, spelling, and for me it is just the accuracy of the facts that you're stating uh, within your manuscript, those need to be very, very accurate. So those are my references for this article, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yogi, for that wonderful presentation on referencing. Um, just to highlight for those who might have missed one or two of the points that we've raised, we had a talk from Dr. Kigera talking about choosing your study question. Highlight was get your why, why am I publishing? Why do I want to do research? Maybe I want to be a professor. And then, um, at the end of your research, always be able to answer, so what? So I've published, how will this uh, uh, research affect the practice of surgery? Is it good to know? Is it nice to know? This is very important. Then we talked uh, with Dr. Ruyaro about the best way to squeeze a camel through the eye of a needle. 
and he highlighted the other issue about the importance of a discussion. Whereas many people might actually say that a research paper falls and, and, and rises and falls on the strength of its methodology, um, I would venture that the discussion is also a very important key component of the paper because that shows now the mind of the author, tells us the interpretation of their um, results in the context of the larger body of knowledge. Dr. Bahati has now taken us through an approach to referencing where it is, she has highlighted the importance of understanding what it is that a journal requires and adhering to that uh, both in your bibliography at the end of, of, of your referencing, at the end of your article, sorry, and also in text citation. I think our panelists have, have really tackled the matters at hand very well because I have yet to see questions in the chat box. But let me venture a question to Dr. Kigera. What is the place for qualitative studies, um, a lot of literature, especially in surgery, is premised on measuring things, percentages, numbers, outcomes. What is the place for qualitative studies in surgical uh, research? Thanks, uh, Dr. Nji here. Um, as scientists, we, we are biased towards things that we can count and uh, we all want uh, the almighty p-value uh, next to a result that we give. But sometimes we realize that there are certain things in human nature that are difficult to count or to account for by counting. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a hospital that I sometimes uh, practice surgery at, and you would give patients, you would prescribe for your post-operative patients a certain opioid, and I think maybe surgeons, uh, many surgeons in this room have undergone what I've gone through. So you indicate a certain opioid uh, for this patient, and then when you come in the morning, the patient tells you they did not get any injection. So when you ask the nurses, they say, we did not give this injection because the patient was not in pain. It might be useful to use qualitative methods like focus group discussions to try and find out what exactly is going on. And actually when we did that at that hospital, we realized there were a lot of phobias and misinformation that had been handed down from generation of nurse to generation of nurse about the addictive properties of opioids and actually about pain management in general. So I was trying to explain to them that probably we want to prevent the pain from occurring, or the nurses were convinced that you shouldn't give it until they are in pain. So while we all want to count things, the number of people who get infected, the number of people who have an implant that lasts beyond 15 years, there is a very big role for the qualitative aspect of, um, uh, of, of, of studies. And I think the Annals of African Surgery has published a couple of papers recently about uh, on some qualitative methods. We've looked at uh, students and how they rate uh, their teachers, how they rate the education they're getting. We've looked at patients and how they rate uh, the information they get on the media, etc., using qualitative methods. So I, I, I'm a firm believer that not everything uh, needs to be counted. Thank you, Dr. J. Thank you, Dr. Kigera, for, for that question. Um, I see several questions coming in through the chat box. We shall go to them. Even as I pose this question to Dr. Riyad, you're, you're the head of a, of a hospital, not just of a unit. So what do you think would be the role of audits to growing the research repertoire of a unit or a hospital? And, and um, have you experimented with any hospital-based uh, disease-specific registries? Thank you, Nji, here for the second question. I will answer no, so that I am left to confabulate about the first question. Anyhow, what is the role of audit in building research questions or the research repertoire? I am sure the audience would want to hear first what the difference between research and audit. And research really by definition is the systematic investigation that is undertaken to discover facts or relationships and reach conclusions using scientifically sound methods. 
the bedrock of research is robust methods and robust data analysis. Audit, on the other hand, is a quality improvement process that seeks to improve patient care and outcomes through review of care frequently, cyclically, continuously against a set explicit criteria and then looking at the shortcomings and slowly over time working on those shortcomings. My experience and my intuition is if you are specific with your audit because the audit as opposed to research is not generalizable. Audit is institutional specific. Two institutions next to each other cannot do, cannot transfer their audit. Each institution does their own audit based on their standards and their local environment. But as you keep improving, you realize perhaps what is accepted knowledge and evidence does not work for you. And you find something that works for you. And that's the aha moment. At that point, you tell the world then that despite X, Y, Z, et al saying that the best intervention for this is this, this does not work in our setup. And that suddenly generates that moment of research. And you start where James Figuera started us off by generating a research question. Thank you. Back to you, Benjamin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ruyaru. I want to ask um, Dr. Bahati about self-citation. What happens when I am an authority in a field? And I want to say, as I did previously, 10 years ago, and repeated a different study five years ago, and current, the current study corroborates all of them. What would be your thoughts on self-citation? And, and perhaps as you do that, maybe you can share with us some tips and tricks for referencing on the go as you write your manuscript. Dr. Bahati. Uh, thank you, Njia, for those questions. Um, so when you've asked um, self-citations, uh, so one I would ask, uh, what is the level of, um, uh, of this evidence that you're um, claiming? One, you can be a very good scientist who's actually done the very high level of, of evidence, uh, RCTs and meta-analysis. So when you're doing this in an article, you would either say, you, you would summarize the point and in the bracket, you will put uh, the number there. And then going down, you might see a match in, in the names of the author and down at the references. So I'll see in G here as the author. And when I go down to the references, I'll see in G here as part of it how you consider it, what is the fact that you're trying to put across. Again, when it comes down to lower levels of um, evidence where it's things like opinions, where are, are, are they actually written in literature? So how then do you say that this uh, through unpublished data or, or an opinion of somebody, it boils down to how you, you're able to cite it. Comes down again to almost even plagiarism where they say, um, does that fall as one of that, uh, one of the classifications of plagiarism? Again, as I said, uh, that might be um, beyond the scopes of this, because I think there's um, a session on ethics in research, and that will be addressed. And then uh, tips and tricks of how to reference while, uh, while, while on the go. Yes, uh, good question. There are many ways of doing it. You could either start your research um, and then at the end you start wondering, okay, so that point, where did I get that from? And that can be very frustrating. So you have like 50 articles and you're wondering this point I saw, where did I pick it from? Um, again, um, knowing the art of how to use the, the softwares um, that we've talked about is as you, First, start with the highest level of evidence when you're trying to defend a point. Then, uh, as we said, you keep coming down and coming closer and closer to your, your situation, which might mean your level of, of, of evidence might be getting lower. As you come through an article that is, is of interest to you, most of the time, especially if it's a meta-analysis, you'll find almost a lot of the information you require will be carried within this article. Although you need to remember, was that article actually written uh, was that sentence in that article written by the authors of this uh, meta-analysis? And that is where you have to be very keen to go back to find actually what is the source of this number 19 and what did they actually say, rather than picking up references from, from articles and just going down to the bibliography and picking it up. What does that do now? If um, I, th I think it's, um, it's Ariaru who then said, you know, you start with your 
uh, introduction, when you start very wide, so you say, you, you know, you're going to pick few articles and pick from that. If that makes facts to you, don't ignore that. I would write that down now. As you keep on researching in your article, you might find something that is more recent than the one you have just cited or more accurate, so to speak, then you tend to just replace that rather than going all the way down and coming back, trying to find out where do I put this. The other point is, as you do your research uh, for an article, you will find facts that will fall um, you know, everywhere. One paper can give you something on introduction and something else on the you know, down, 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 and you're trying to say whether this, um, whether this thing works or doesn't work. Um, so that is also something I would say that an article, one article can give you more than one um, uh, idea in that paper. So also just think broadly and say, what do I want to answer uh, when I'm reading uh, towards this project? Thank you, Gia. Thank you, Dr. Yogi, for that concise response. I'll, I'll share some of my tips and tricks and hopefully it would help someone out there who might be struggling, especially if you're thinking about how to start. One of the things is um, for any question or manuscript that I would be working on, I'd put them all in a folder. And then I would have, for example, if I'm writing the introduction, I put a subfolder for introduction. And even as I do the, the different areas of the manuscript, so example, I'm working on the introduction, for example, at the beginning, I would then, uh, for if I find a statement in a paper that I would want to reference, I, I write it down and I write down the perhaps the author, at least the first author and the year for that paper within the manuscript. Now, what is the important bit is, is how I save the PDF for the reference article. I would actually save it in the same format that it would appear in the referencing that for the journal that I'm targeting, for example. So if it was written by Ryogi B, even as I save the PDF, I will save it as Ryogi B 2009 and then the subject, and then the, 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 the title of the article. So you find that even when you're retrieving uh, references and trying to find the specific statement for which you're attributing that paper, it actually is easy to find. This becomes important because some of the challenges we found is where individuals copy references from other articles without necessarily getting the actual meat of the paper. We'll have you know that the editors do actually go and access articles to see whether they say what you purport they say. So for example, if you make a very strong statement and the seminal paper that you have quoted is in German, you might sometimes find that the editors request you for the, the, the actual paper that you did read to be able to derive that statement. So it makes good practice to be downloading the actual PDF as you go about um, doing your writing your manuscript. I will ask Mohammed to look through the chat box and even as he looks through the questions that are, are there. The other thing, the tip that I wanted to share with, with those who are in postgraduate, is a lot of the time you might want not to start doing your method, your results section, uh, just because you haven't started the, the, the data collection or progressed that far down. One of the recommendations I would have is start working with an N of equals one. You've, you've gotten your first uh, data set in, start writing out your results section. And I would even challenge you to start drafting your discussion section based on the hypothesis that you had going into writing the manuscript. Once you do that, as your numbers start racking up, you find that that discussion would actually change. If you find a result that you didn't anticipate, you'll actually go and say, hmm, and it will answer the question of how come. How come these results are giving me a different picture from what I had thought of? you find that that makes for a richer discussion as you write your manuscript. Mohammed, what do we have in our chat box? Okay, in the chat box, we have someone asking about, um, uh, can you reference an abstract for articles that are not open? Uh, yes. Dr. Yogi, what would you have to say towards that? Okay, the danger, the danger of citing 
an abstract without looking at the full article, you might actually be quoting something that is not completely accurate. Remember, the abstract is really giving you a super summary. They need to summarize what they've done in 150 words. And they have put there, you know, a statement that gives, you know, uh, however, as a researcher, where we are saying you have done a thorough work and what you're giving is accurate, what will be a prudent is for you to find the full article, go through it and actually see is what they are putting in the summary actually a true reflection of what we are seeing in the body of the paper. So is the, you know, first, there are things you want to question as a researcher, was the methodology actually uh, um, waterproof? Was it to actually give the conclusions they've given above, the numbers they've given, the analysis of the data, was it done accurately to actually give us that conclusion? So, and that is what now cites, what quality of uh, referencing are you given? So what I would say, I know, as you say, there are articles that are not open, but then we have other resources on how we, we can get these um, um, articles that are not necessarily open access. So even here can remind us of what other uh, modalities you can go, you can get this uh, through. You can um, go through universities, libraries that might have access to some of this. Us being in a developing country, we have access to some of these articles. It's just finding your way around and seeing how do I get hold of the paper that is linked to this abstract that he's saying this for me to fact proof and say, what are they saying is actually, is it true? Is the methodology sound? And is the analysis actually uh, reflecting what we are seeing in the abstract? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bahati. Someone also asked, um, I probably pose this to the editor in chief. Is there value in having research groups or collaborative teams when conducting research in the surgical field? Uh, thanks uh, for the person who asked that question. Uh, I would say that medical training is removes the the usual thing that you find in other in other professions of people coming together as groups when you are in a ward round and Dr. Arueru is asking you to read the history. Uh, the focus is on you at that at that moment. When you're doing the surgery, the patient has focused on you and doesn't understand that there's another team of 30 odd people who are trying to get them well. So over time, we become very individualistic as, as we grow in our surgical careers. And that sometimes poses the challenges when we want to do research that sometimes is difficult to do as one person. So I think it's very important to do the following. One, start early, start your research career early. Start it as a medical student. That is in high school, if you can, the earlier you start, the better. And participate in teams. The teams will help you learn, they'll help you grow. And I think I saw, also saw a question about someone who has never performed a study before. I think the best thing would be to walk over to the prof in your department who is studying Hanyas and ask him, can I participate in this? In the beginning, Probably you'll only be allowed to collect data. You might not even appear on the manuscript, but you learn some skills and the next one becomes easier. So groups are absolutely vital. And I would encourage that all of us, wherever we are, we try and form this. I know there's been a move to try and do that in some parts. Say for example, the university, certain groups, certain hospitals, but we need to do more on that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Giger. Probably when you're still on that question, someone also asked, do you find that universities will be more receptive to qualitative research uh, by MMED students? Doctor. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> a political question. But uh, I, I think, like I said, we surgeons are, are more tuned to things that we're able to count. And it, it happens in the, in the whole of medicine. But I think there's a role for qualitative uh, qualitative research. And I think as an MMED student, as long as what you're trying to do is novel and he's going to answer a question that has not been answered before or show us a different aspect about something that hasn't been done before, I think this is doable. I, I might be wrong, but I think uh, Dr. Juka did his PhD uh, partly or primarily on some uh, qualitative uh, data 
So I think this is doable even at MMED level, and I think nobody should shy away from attempting to do it. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Higuera. Now, someone also, <clears throat> someone also asks, uh, comment on the place of italicization of the author's name while quoting the author in the text. Probably Dr. Bahat would answer this. Uh, thank you. I think that's from Patrick Migai. Place of utilization of the author's name while quoting the author in the text. Again, this comes down to the particular style. As I said, um, uh, I think what you're referring to might actually be is it the Harvard style that usually has the name of the author, um, comma, and year. While that might not have a place in Vancouver that requires you to just put the idolized uh, name, unless I'm not getting it right, unless you're trying to say, as um, you're, you're trying to quote Muigai, for example, if you're trying to say, and um, Muigai at all said, uh, of, of what I'm aware in, in Vancouver, you don't need to idolize that. However, in other um, referencing styles, then they require you to put the, the author's uh, name as idolized. Again, pay attention to the details of what does that um, um, journal article require you to do then you adhere to that. At the same breath, just to answer the question about um, uh, role of collaborative work, and I'm glad in this setup we still have members from the SSK, council members from the SSK. This is something actually we need to explore. And um, because we have many surgical students uh, in a class, or even in a year, if we to put the whole country uh, you know, together, what are the chances that we'll all come up with 100 um, innovative ideas in the four years that you're under training and you're also doing other things so you're not a dedicated researcher we need to put our minds together and come up with collaborative work where students can then be involved in them and run with them at their particular institution that teaches them then in in terms of ethical work what do i need to do so they'll be able to do take the protocol for ethical review, make sure it's been cleared, make sure they'll have an experience on data collection. They will now have an experience on how was that data um, analyzed and come up with even a summary of their center, how they came up with, uh, you know, what were the conclusions so that these students that have to sit down and actually go through the whole process. But how can we mentor them together in life or science changing uh, data rather than going to do, I think what somebody is asking, retrospective work while, while do, doing MF. But this is out there to, you know, for debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bahadi, for that um, in the response. Now, we also have a question for, uh, that states, and probably put this to Dr. Ariadne. The question is, what would be your advice for someone who doesn't have any publications? Is it better uh, they co-author or do it solely? Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, Adesek, for that question. I, I hope that's how you pronounce your name. Others will give different testimonies to their first publications. If you have a good mentor, you could easily order a simple first article. If it's a kid's report, you might not remember to, you might not need to co-order, you might just need a mentor to guide you through there. If it's a letter to the editor, you might not need co-authorship, might need someone to mentor you. However, the easiest part I know for those who have the privilege of working with seniors who are deep into research is to be co-opted as a co-author and along the way you learn the ropes. So it's really situation dependent and depends on what resources you have available. As a journal, we do not impose a, a requirement on every author that the first time they are ordering a single author, they should prove evidence, they should have evidence of prior publication as co-authors. I hope that answers you. Thank you back to you, Mohammed. Allow me to take it up from here. Uh, we, as, as our EIC thing um, seeks to answer the other question that was there about do we accept annotated bibliographies within the journal? Uh, amongst our audience, we have Patrick Chamanua. I hope I got that right. I wanted him to share some light about um, qualitative and mixed methods, his, his experience with 
qualitative and mixed methods research and how briefly he believes that these can be incorporated into the mainstay of what we practice as surgeons um, in this region and indeed even within the, uh, the continent. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Benjamin, and good evening to you all. Thank you for a very great uh, discussion on research and publication. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, there has been, I would call it a stereotype that is still carrying on to date in many circles about qualitative research being of a lesser quality than quantitative research. But that paradigm is changing quite fast and there is a big movement now towards the qualitative research and even better mixed methods where you have both the qualitative and quantitative. I think we should start opening the brackets because when you look at the hierarchy now of, of evidence, uh, previously, we've been taught that it has to be an RCT or better still a systematic review of RCTs to give you better evidence. But the argument now, the discourse actually is embracing qualitative research and we are now dealing with evidence synthesis in, meta in, in, in uh, uh, systematic reviews, again to, to embrace the qualitative nature. And as surgeons, there is a lot that can be done qualitatively. When we look at the quality of care, because we've been so used to counting numbers and have forgotten the experience, for example, of our clients, we've forgotten to analyze factors for and against quality in our practice. All these are best measured actually qualitatively. And uh, the issue with qualitative which many would struggle to, to, to appreciate is that numbers do not necessarily make the strength. It is the interpretation and, and analysis of what you get from say the focus group discussions or the key informant interviews or other things that you actually analyze and show methodically, I, I mean methodically how you have come up with this conclusion that you are saying. And the other thing with qualitative is that we don't very much look at generalizability of the findings. It is really trying to explain the observations, those issues that have been volunteered by the people you have interacted with or by the things you have observed. It could be ethnographic research, for example, you're just seeing how do Kenyan surgeons conduct themselves in theater and you just go there, scrub, but don't talk to anyone or you might talk to anyone and uh, you just have to document what you see and go back and analyze. So there is a place and which it is us to accept that that place is there. If you want to ask a patient how the consent process was and how the post-operative period and the follow-up and interaction with the medical team was, that is best done qualitatively. And that's the best way we can actually improve our practice. So I would like to make a case that let us open up our minds to accept qualitative evidence as a good evidence, equally good. Sometimes it's the only evidence that can help us understand the context and cultural setups of issues. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I think we are coming to the tail end. It has been a wonderful session hearing from our editors as they uh, spoke on choosing a study question, the structure of a manuscript, as well as referencing. I, I trust that we have all gotten nuggets that we can use to spur or improve on our own experiences of publishing in surgery. Before I conclude, I wanted to share about just to highlight what one of the, the, the speakers has talked about, participating in research. For a lot of us, we might want to go into the deep end. You want to be a contributing author, but I'll share one of the insights that I learned from one of my professors, which was you must learn the 
the effort that it takes to actually abstract the data. So at one point, you must be involved as a data abstractor. That builds on you the confidence that even as you move ahead to be at the point where you are coordinating data abstractors, not even maybe the main author, that you have the understanding of the processes involved. This way you literally work your way up the ladder in terms of, of participating in research. And you'll find that at some point in time, then you have the necessary expertise to actually be the head of a collaborative group that is coordinating multinational studies because you understand what it is that is happening at the grassroots level. With us, come to the end of this installment in our series. Remember, you can find us online on www.annalsofafricansurgery.com, as well as follow us on Twitter at African Surgery. You, I have asked that those who require CPD points share them to direct message. And if you're not within Kenya, please share your country so that we can format this appropriately. For those who make want copies of the presentation, this copies of the presentation, as well as the recording for this webinar shall be up on our website, www.annalsofafricansurgery.com by Monday, 5 p.m. GMT plus three hours. Look out for our next webinar on the ethics in surgical research within the month of October. I have been your host, Ben Jehia from Nairobi, Kenya. Have a good night. Thank you all.